Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Adventures in Careerland! Season six, number six, and our continuum, our sixty seventh show. How exciting! I'm your host, Adriano Magnifico, and I'm we're broadcast, and I'm here with co-hosts and a special guest, and we're broadcasting from the Louis Riel Arts and Technology Center. That's a very cool place in the Louis Riel School Division that offers applied technical and apprenticeship training for thirteen programs. And it includes this one, the Broadcast Media Program, the gem of the programs. And that's these programs where students decide in their high school life, I need something a little more. I'm tired of the K-12 to plan. I need to jump off that beaten path. And they come to places like this. And in places like automotive technology, baking and pastry, buildings and trades, electrical trades, information systems, hairstyling, new media design, students find opportunities for their skill sets, for their better selves, for chances to see how they can move and fly in areas that aren't defined by the traditional high school curriculum. So I'm always proud of the students who come here because they made a call, they made a choice, and most high school students don't do that. They just follow the path. And the great part about this place is we give intense career development here. So we ask about the student's story, where they're at, what they're good at, what's important to them, what they value, what skills they have, what skills they want to acquire, and we connect them to opportunities to practice those skills outside of this building. Very important stuff. And we find that our students always come back at the Arts and Technology Center and say, it's a life changer for me, game changer for me, having a chance to think about my own future and reflect on it. And that's a place where schools sometimes don't do as well. They don't give you time to reflect. And here we do a lot of reflection. And so I am really blessed and pleased to have two co-hosts from the broadcast media program, that gem, one of the 13 programs. They are co-hosts. They are co-hosts for the entire semester. And they are finding their chops in the broadcast media program. And I'm with Caden. Caden, how are you? I'm great. How are you? All right. Tell me, Caden, what were you doing today in broadcast media land? Uh, today, well, we were just editing some videos about uh, that we did yesterday. Some uh, We did some interviews and supposed to do them a certain way for all the shots like rule thirds and all that and we're just basically just the start starting all that and i guess right now they're doing the rest and it's getting a little better uh we didn't do too well yesterday but you know what you've got yeah. the you've got the keanu reeves voice <laughs> yeah it's got that deep little piece to it and, uh, you know, yeah and he's got a unique voice you, you, you're gonna say about 30 things in this podcast like john wick does and it'll just yeah. be perfect it'll yeah. be perfect anyway and we're with caitlin caitlin Hi. middlestad how are you i'm good how are you all right, Caitlin, what have you been doing all day? Same thing. We've been watching. Um, we've been going What did you learn videos. today? Because I was in that room and I watched what you were doing. What did you learn? Tell me something you learned today. Um, Tell me to about the light. How to make sure the light is good and not oh. to shoot by a window. <laughs> Unless you use... What's it called? The gel. <laughs> It the, looked, gel. the gel. The gel, the window gel. It looked like, for me, I was, I was watching going, why don't they just cover the window? And I'm an idiot. Why don't they just cover the window? Well, they do cover the window, but they have special terms for yeah. it. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. I think the stuff you learn here, and then you're going to go out and try it? Mm -hmm. That's what I love about this program. You don't sit here and just learn information, regurgitate it on a test. You have to go actually cover a window out there yeah. and yeah. see what happens to the light when you shoot it with these high-performance cameras that you people use, these, these industry standard cameras, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So, hey, I want to ask you something. My Gen Z minions here, I want to ask you something. I was just reading another article, and it, this stuff bothers me. I guess I don't do a lot about it. I'm an old, I'm a young baby boomer, but sometimes we recycle, we take care of things. The environment, I saw an article just today about how ducks are having trouble migrating back to Canada because their habitats are being destroyed. How does that affect you when you hear that? And I say that because we actually, my wife and I, I well, I'm being generous to myself. My wife actually uh, kind of harvests butterflies, monarch butterflies. And we did that mm -hmm. a couple years ago. We had, oh my gosh, dozens of butterflies in our yard. And she planted milkweed, which butterflies use. And we had honestly hundreds of butterflies in our yard. And they were laying eggs and we were watching them hatch in these containers we had. It was, it was an amazing thing. Last year we had almost 
no butterflies because they said there was a decline in the population and they migrate. The story of a monarch butterfly is it flies all the way back to California or mm -hmm. through Mexico. It's, it's this 2,000 kilometer or something run, something crazy mm -hmm. like that. But declining, and these are pollinators. The bees are pollinators. The ducks are coming and they're not finding their habitats in place. How does that, what do you think when you hear about that stuff? Do you care? Yeah, but I mean, I think, I, I thought ducks usually just kind of Yeah, but you said, you know? yeah, but. <laughs> I don't know. Ducks, they kind of go anywhere. And just, uh, <laughs> I thought the only need is like a pond and people feeding them bread and stuff. You know, like. Well, so, so that's a solution. Well, that's not a solution. I, I'm just, I, I think I, you solved the solution. Get your old bread and feed it to no, ducks. No. Well done. Well done, Caden. Again, environmentalist Caden. <laughs> Caitlin, do you want to add something to this really intelligent conversation? I don't have anything smart to say other than it <laughs> no, makes that me upset. You? It makes you it upset. It does, yeah. So is that something you're going to think about as you move forward? Does it matter the companies you work for that they're environmental and that they're do yeah. they're mm -hmm. trying to make a difference? Would that matter to you? Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. If if, if they're you know trying to look out for. I guess the world. so. I think you got to think. I'm putting my hand <laughs> on his shoulder now, like a, a a sage a sage old guy from a Hallmark movie saying. <laughs> I think you got to think harder about this, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So it, it will be something to consider because this yeah. stuff is going on right under your eyes. Yeah. And I've seen it happen with our monarch butterflies. I see it with the bee population was really down last year. Mm -hmm. These are the pollinators. These are the food suppliers of the world. What happens if those guys are gone because we're not looking after the environment? Yeah. Yeah. So I want you to think when you leave today, <laughs> I want you to think, what am I going to do to make a difference? Don't think about it now because I, I, I can see your brains are on fire, okay? But next time we meet, I'm going to ask you, so what have you thought about, okay? That's your okay. assignment for the week. Right. I'm teacher now. I'm going to say that's okay. the assignment for the week. So, hey, we've got a podcast to get to. Yeah. Uh, looking for more in-depth conversation. Thanks, you two. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we got a guest today. I think we're going to have a doozy. It's going to be a humdinger of a show today because we have a Windsor Park grad way back in the day from 2006 and he is an actor a working actor who's developed an acting academy here and he's got an interesting story and of course i ran into him on linkedin this is where i run into most of my people now back on linkedin a lot of students connect to me on facebook and linkedin and i always think they've got a great story to tell that's the purpose of this podcast remember it's always about what's the story and who can listen to the story and think about ah oh, i can do that or I see some of myself in that. Or, hey, this guy did something that I can do. I'm talking about our guest, Michael Strickland. Michael, how are you? Oh, I am brilliant. Feeling fantastic this morning. Thank you for asking. We've never had that answer. <laughs> no, no. It's, it's, it feels like it's the most generic answer. It's just like, how are you doing? Well, I'm feeling great today, so thanks for asking. I like it because this guy, this person is a real actor. Mm -hmm. Okay? He's an actor with a lot of voices. He's had a lot of voiceovers. And yes. I remember him back in Windsor Park Collegiate. I met him back in my, in my time in Windsor Park Collegiate near the end of his sojourn because his mom was a, a, a federal MP. And I interacted with his mom on various things. And then I ran, in, ran into Michael and discovered that was his mom. And pretty cool. Think back to Windsor Park, Michael. Oh. 2006. God. What was the hallway like for you? What was going through your head as a young person going through there and thinking about, I'm getting out of here soon. What am I going to do? Uh, I, I, it's so funny because I, I started thinking about 2006. And I'm like, man, back in the days when I was wearing Heelys in the hallway. I was getting yelled at by the principal. Don't do that. And then when they turn their back, you slowly scoot away. And I'm confessing that now, obviously, because I can't get in trouble anymore. But, uh, man, 2006 was, was interesting because, I mean, ever since I was a kid, I've always known that I wanted to be an actor. That's, that's been my passion since I was probably about five or six. Um, but like many people, I, I didn't really know exactly how to go about tackling that specific field like what do I do how do I get into the film industry and it wasn't actually until grade uh, I think it was 10 yeah grade 10 is when I actually did my very first film ever uh, where I guess there was like a casting call to Windsor Park Collegiate um, to have a bunch of students come in and do extra work in the background for this movie called uh, Full of It with Ryan Pinkston and Carmen Electra and I remember myself and Stephanie Rosanzoff and Leanne, like uh, Leanne Oaks, a bunch of us all went to this casting call for like the day. Um, 
And they, they ended up picking me out of the crowd and had me stand directly behind Ryan Pinkston for a shot. So I got like camera full on face and it was like, that's my first experience ever with film. And I went, okay, yeah, this is awesome. As much as I love theater and I, I still to this date do very minor theater, like fringe shows and stuff, but um, that was the, the spark that went, okay, this is what I want to pursue. I want to figure out how to go about doing this. But I wish, I wish, I wish I knew about Arts and Tech Center uh, programs like this when I was getting out of Windsor Park because I will tell you right now, I would have, I would have been first in line camping out in front of the doors because this is the coolest thing I have seen yet in a school program since probably ever. Actually, I think Vancouver was the last time I saw something as cool as this. Like this is as cool as this space right here. Oh yeah, yeah. like this is uh, like so. I I went to Vancouver Film School uh, when I was about twenty five and actually uh, took the one year film and uh, television training intensive and. It's very, like, there's a lot of stuff that's very similar to this. So the the fact that we actually almost secretly, and I say that just because, of course, I didn't even know about this until literally walking in, that you guys have a program and a facility that is equivalent to Vancouver Film Schools. That is a, that is an accomplishment, I'll tell you. They have some crazy stuff over there. Uh, and I've had unbelievable success and a lot of people that have obviously gone into the, to the major film industry. But um, yeah, I'd like I to, to kind of go back to your question, I, I genuinely wasn't too sure exactly how to go about doing it. I thought, you know, I'll go to university and I'll try to figure it out there. I'll take theater classes there. And I, you know, signed up at the University of Manitoba my very, very first year, like every university person is like yes, yes. I don't know what to do so I guess yes. I'll just do yes. you won but at least you had a deep sense of uh, I want to be in the drama gig mm-hmm. so where does that come from as as a young person as a little kid you said since I was a little kid yeah. I wanted to do that so where did that come from so uh, this this story I, <laughs> I feel like I've told this story a few times it's great I love it um, so I was about five or six years old and I was doing uh, dance class ironically and of course, I'm the only guy in the class at the time. There was a group of, I think there was about four, four or five girls, and then there was myself. So what we basically did was they did this beautiful little routine of nice dancing, ballet, whatever it might be, uh, and then they would bow and twinkle off, as it were. Uh, and then my person, they had me like sneak in and be all like, almost like conniving and like, almost like an agent, right? Or like a, a thief, just sneaking into the room. And then I start doing weird things like Russians and crazy dances. And then the girls chase me off stage and I run. And it made so everyone... They, br- so, so do they stereotype you? Is that... <laughs> <laughs> no, just, just a little. Just um, a little. But no, the, the, I ended up um, getting chased off the stage and it actually made people burst out laughing. Uh, like everybody in the room was just cheering and like laughing. So the, the joy that that brought me and I was like, holy smokes, I'm making people are happy and, and 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 I'm getting a sense of satisfaction out of that as well and that was kind of the spark for me uh, when we of course went and did our bows and all the the lovely ladies bow and then I step out and bow and there's a standing ovation people are losing their mind I'm like oh I love it. I, I love this this is this is great I just managed to make everybody happy which in turn made me happy and that is how I want to impact the world is because we obviously, as you can imagine, there's enough lovely things going on in our world to make us zombies yes, and, yes, yes. <laughs> and such. So yeah. to be able to, to have this escape to, to really bring joy and impact other people in, in, in a positive way or, or in an inspirational way, uh, that was really what made me go, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do this forever. I just, of course, growing up, had no idea how to do it. So Well, that's... That's super interesting because uh, I imagine in class, were you a class clown? <laughs> Did you like to like to get the wry comments from teachers and some of the chuckles from the classmates? Sometimes, but ironically, it was you know, and, and or did they try to quell you? Like that stuff happens too. School's an institutional thing where it just says, "No, this is the plan. Sit here in your in your box and get it done." Yeah, yeah, and, and it's it's a combination of that mixed with like, 
So in, in high school, I was very much in the universe of every grade. Um, whereas during that time, and I don't know if that's changed a ton, but during that time, it was very much like uh, if you're grade 12, you can talk to grade 11s, but that's it. You talk to grade 10s and 9s, you're just weird, dude. Yeah, right. Like you're almost becoming an outcast. Yeah, you had to abuse the nines. Not, yeah, not, exactly. Not talk to them. Not yeah. be friends with them. Just, <laughs> just freshies, right? Um, but no, and and I actually became uh, good friends and, and very sociable with all grade nines, tens, elevens, twelves. It didn't really matter. Um, so because of that, I was very much the nerdy, but also jock because I did my theater. I did hang out with the the younger kids. I did hang out with my age group, but I and you know would hang out with obviously I played soccer, dodgeball, a little bit of basketball, volleyball, all that fun stuff in, in high school. So it was on the jockey side as well. But I kind of found a, a, this nice little pocket to kind of float between everyone. So it was like you almost couldn't be too much of a class clown because it's like and read you, your audience. Yeah, you alienate a few, right? Yeah. And, so and and, and, and and the teachers. So, yeah. hey, when you're going to the U of M then, you choose U of M, and that's a great call because it's it's connecting to your, your inner self, your best self, your instincts to move forward with that stuff. Mm-hmm. And and you worked in the, I told you, we were talking yesterday, I was, the, I was part of that team that started the Black Hole Theater Company at the University of Manitoba yeah. in 1982 in University College, and I couldn't believe what a dump this theater was. Right, it was in the bottom of nothing. Mm-hmm. So you were in that program. Yep. I, I heard they got a nice new theater and everything. I've never been to it. I've got to go see that theater. I'm the same boat. It's, it's ironic. Um, my year was actually the very last year that uh, we had that theater before we transitioned into the brand new theater, which I myself also have not seen this theater. So I assume it's as stunning as everyone says. Uh, if it's the place I'm thinking it is, then then yes, it, it's beautiful, it's huge, it's yes. all that jazz, but yes. yeah, do tell. Yes, so when you're going through the theater program, did you major in theater? Like I that, did. That was your major in theater? What did you minor in? What were other things that connected to you? Because as much as you got to go through the theater mm-hmm. gig and and let that flow through you, there's the other pieces of what, what else is connecting to you as you go around there at theater? What's attract, What's sticking to you? What's What are you gravitating towards? Uh, so I was a uh, I was a big fan of English, um, so I I actually minored in English. Originally, I was going to major in English, and then I'm like, you know what? Let's be real. You know what you're the most passionate about, so focus on that. Um, also, honestly, I had more credits in my theater, so I'm like, man, instead of having to be in university for another three years, let's just finish it off with a major in theater. Um, but then I minored in English. I was also a big fan of history um, because especially, especially in the film industry uh, and, and in acting, you want to know the history of film. Um, I, I remember one of the classes I took in university was called The Art of Film, and it was genuinely about the artistic side of film. So, for example, we would watch something like Punch Drunk Love with Adam Sandler. Yes, and we yes. would break down, okay, we notice that Adam Sandler's character is wearing blue all the time. This main reason behind that is, of course, because he's a fairly depressed character. He's very low, very sad, all that. And whereas his opposite counterpart is always wearing red, passion, love, fire, um, excitement, right? So understanding the artistic side of it uh, to help influence character choices and decisions that you make throughout that process. Um, and then, of course, you learn things about like the very first film ever made, which very pop quick question to the two lovely co-hosts. Do you guys happen to know what the very first film ever made was? And I'm not talking about the uh, the train coming or the oh. like. I'm talking about the very first quote unquote feature film ever mm-hmm. made. Do you remember what it's? Do you know what it's called? I did at one point, but I can't remember. That's okay. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't no. Think I know, no. It? It's called It's called A Trip to the Moon. It was made in 1901 by a guy named Georges Méliès. Georges Méliès is actually the guy who basically invented special effects for mm-hmm. movies. So that's the he is the reason we have Spider-Man, Iron Man, all those crazy special effects that you see in movies, Avatar, all of that is because of him. He was a magician. Mm-hmm. And he would do magic tricks on the set uh-huh. to cause those effects. And people were like, what? And that's what sparked uh-huh. special effects. Hmm. So, 
fun little historical fact. <laughs> that's, that's an awesome fun little fact. <laughs> yeah. And Caitlin, did you really know that? I, I heard about it at one point. I love that. But can't remember. I love that. It You'll remember this forever now. I will. And okay. you can find it on YouTube, too. It, the, the, mm. the movie is, so for a feature film at that time, that was, I think, 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. oh. That was feature film to them. Um, and it's very cool to watch how they go about doing those special effects because they mm. basically shoot a bullet at the moon and it lands in the moon's eye. And it's like, it's, <laughs> it's hilarious. It's great to watch. Well, those are great. I'm an old Star Trek here. I'm an old Trekkie, right? Mm. So I remember mm. there in some of those memoirs, Kirk's memoirs or Shatner's memoirs and stuff, they talk about they'll, they'll hang this uh, enterprise in the sky and put a blank or put a blank, a, a black curtain behind her or something and just poke a bunch of holes and with flashlights or something shoot, make it look like stars running through the universe. Amazing yep. stuff, right? And that, yeah. those were the special effects. I remember them talking about in one of them. They were Desilu Studios and uh, because they had no budget, they were right beside Universal or something. At the end of the day, they'd go into the Universal garbage can and grab props to make their props because yeah. they had no money. It was amazing. <laughs> like some of those things were where were Spock is... Um, or McCoy is bending over a red-shirted dead guy with a, a tricorder going, doo -doo 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 -doo. he's got a salt shaker from the commissary. Like, and, and, and they talk about these things, right? Yeah. And at the end of the show, there's salt all over the guy or something. It's amazing stuff. So think about those shows. What kind of shows did you do back in uh, the Black Hole Theater? You had to do those little shows, right? Mm -hmm. I remember doing all those where we had to be behind the uh, stage as, as support team, and then also acting in them. Yes. What were those like? Were those some of the best moments in, in, in your theater time? I just found they were so much fun and ridiculous. Oh, yeah. my gosh. So there, I, I remember there were uh, lunch bags, um, which were just like many theater productions that you did during like lunch times and whatnot. Um, I don't know if they do lunch bags still. I should I should inquire because I'm Never always down to watch them from theater. But, yeah, basically a lunch bag is like, there's there's the the feature theater show which is like you know an hour and a half something like that long two hours long uh, and then there are lunch bags which are just short little theater productions that last 20 30 minutes long something like that uh, usually a small cast maybe four people or less uh, and I did a couple of lunch bags when I was at uh, at U of M but I did do a few bigger productions and I'll I'll never forget the process of both backstage and on stage. The stuff that I learned in backstage, still to this day, I use. Just for like, for example, building a fence and whatnot. I learned how to use most of the power tools and whatnot from backstage. Yes, yes absolutely. It's unbelievably, incredibly useful information that you learn from that, that even if you're like, oh, well, maybe I'm not gonna continue on with film or theater or whatever it might be. The skills that you learn in those programs are so beneficial hey, in other things. Hey, you got to keep mm -hmm. the dog in the yard at home. So, yeah. so <laughs> exactly. It's a pretty useful tool to build a fence. Mm -hmm. Stop uh, the uh, neighbors uh, from watching you. That's right. <laughs> that's right as well. Hey, the interesting one of the interesting things is you you went to Vancouver for a long time. Vancouver mm -hmm. to me, they talk about Vancouver. Toronto is the Hollywood of the North. Vancouver has that rep a bit too, right? As as this space as um, these great Hollywood spaces where mm -hmm. people come to do movies. They have the landscapes, they have the beautiful locales, they have the giant populations, they have the giant skyscrapers. Yeah. So you can do these different different movies about different things. Winnipeg has its own unique place. But you spent six years here in Van you spent a year in Vancouver film school, mm -hmm. then you spent six years there. Yeah. So what are you doing in Vancouver for six years? Uh, so ironically, after I graduated, um, I spent a big chunk of time, immediately right away I, I went looking for an agent who I was with for literally the whole time I was there until I until I left, um, and I spent the other time trying to audition as much as possible because I wanted to be that Orlando Bloom success story. Which fun fact, if you guys don't know, Orlando Bloom after he graduated from his uh, film program that he took, he got cast in Pirates of the Caribbean and Lord of the Rings. Hmm. So well, well, that was a lucky break, I think. <laughs> uh, just a little. So I was like, oh, man. And I think at the time, ironically, they were casting Star Wars Episode uh, 7, I'm pretty sure. So Force wow. Awakens. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and I was like, that's it. 
that this is going to be my Orlando Bloom moment. I'm going to get into Star Wars, and I'm going to also complete a lifelong journey of becoming a Jedi. And even if I get killed off in two seconds, I can be like, I was there, man. <laughs> um, do, do or do not. There is no trust. See, he knows. Well, that, <laughs> that's <it>. perfect. <laughs> I love it. Um, but yeah, that, that's so I, I spent a large chunk of time just trying to get um, trained up as well as uh, auditioning for as many films and productions as I could. Um, and then I actually spent five years uh, at this lovely institution called Arts Umbrella, which is like a, an extracurricular art school. So you can go there for painting, drawing, uh, coding, uh, acting, whatever it might be. Dance. Oh, my gosh. Their, their, their dance program is probably one of the most renowned in Canada. So is that all volunteer stuff there? You're just showing up with a group of dedicated people in the profession? You have to buy into you you have to pay to go you do have to pay to go yeah okay okay but uh yeah so i i got hired there and ironically that was uh because i i had said to myself i'm like i'm i'm tired of being a server which i had been for many many years and i'm like yeah but you've got the good look you look like doug (laughs) from the keg okay (laughs) (laughs) oh lord I, I mean that with great respect. And I, it's hard to be a great Doug at the keg. Yeah. Oh gosh. But and, and, and ironically, like I, I, as much as I enjoyed serving, um, which is, and I, I say it's ironic because I still have nightmares, and I haven't served probably since I was about twenty five, twenty five or twenty six, which is almost ten years ago. Um, I haven't served since then, and I still have nightmares. <laughs> of like 15 tables get sat at once the kitchen's behind there's no other server on the floor and you're like i'm sorry do you want bread (laughs) (laughs) so so occasionally are you in a winnipeg restaurant and then you just look around you you run out of the place in horror ptsd just (laughs) i can't do it (laughs) where did the guy go he didn't fill my water glass i gotta go I don't want to tell him because then he's going to have the same thing. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. But, uh, but no, I, so I, I started, uh, I looked up, um, uh, a friend of mine at the time had told me to look up just a couple of uh, acting, teaching jobs. So uh, I looked it up. One of the first things I found was Arts Umbrella, which I had no idea who they were, what it was, or anything like that. And the only place that they were offering a teaching position at was about 45 minutes away from where I was living. So I was driving typically about an hour and a half every day just to get to and from work. Um, but that's that was part of the grind. Is, it there, was, is there a lot of traffic in Vancouver? <laughs> <laughs> no. God, no. Not at all. The, that is thick sarcasm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm thick. Um, especially once rush hour comes. There's... Uh, hmm, I don't know why we're even going to talk about their their highway systems and whatnot. Long story short, once traffic or like uh, whatever it was that I was just saying, uh, rush hour. <laughs> once rush hour actually starts, it's you you're sitting still on mm. the road on a highway that's 110 uh-huh. for probably half an hour. Oh wow, to an hour. It's it's do you, brutal. Do you, do you like living in Winnipeg now, kids? <laughs> Well, <laughs> so, and here's the thing, though. Like, if you, if you, and this, this is definitely for the two of you. Like, if you're both extremely passionate about the film industry, I cannot stress how incredibly important it is for you to stay here right now. Mm-hmm. I know you're probably thinking, ah, you know, I should go off to Vancouver. I should go to Toronto. Those are the places to be. That's what everybody knows about. We are changing that very quickly right now in Winnipeg. We have hands down the best tax credit, which is very, uh, which is a huge incentive for film production companies to come here. We do not have enough people on the crew side. We have some of the best crew I have ever worked with. I love every single one of the people that I get to work with on set. Mm -hmm. But when you get four, five, six, seven productions all going on at the same time, both filming here, in Selkirk, downtown, sometimes Brandon, like Niverville, there we run low on production crew. And mm-hmm. then it goes, well, we have to say no or we have to postpone. So to reject work would be like the worst thing we could do. So to stay here and have the opportunity, like what I'm seeing right now at Arts yeah. and Tech, like this is 
Holy smokes. There's there's so and much opportunity. Think about it. As a high school student doing this. Oh my I wish. Think I it, wish. Think about the like the extra opportunities they're getting that you never even had the you were thinking about where do I go? They were already in it. They're already immersed in this. I had to grind eh? so hard to find this stuff. Now, don't get me wrong, there are certain things that I could have gotten to, like maybe I could have looked a little bit more into like Winnipeg Film Group or things like that. And I know that there's there's a lot of expenses that go behind our industry. It's it, mm -hmm. You are signing up to be a student for life, neither here nor there, whether you're an actor or part of a crew and whatnot, because things change all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Technology mm -hmm. changes, um, process for actually filming things change, so. Uh, but man, I... What I would have killed for to have the opportunities that you guys have right now here, and I'm not just saying that because I'm sitting here in this room and you guys have me on your podcast. I'm genuinely, like walking in, it was like a what? Seeing people walk through the hallways with like good quality film gear yeah. and like not the handheld like thing that you <laughs> see at the soccer games from mom <laughs> or, or, your or your phone. Or your phone. Oh, yeah. Don't get, and, and, and listen, using your phone, is, especially if you have no access to the stuff outside of this, out of this school, your phone is a phenomenal piece of technology that you can use to be able to get film, mm -hmm. right? I mean, most of these films shoot, or most of these cameras shoot better than a lot of DSLRs that you see out there. Yeah. So use this if you have it. Use whatever you have access to, but just keep creating. You guys are doing great. Yeah. Well, tell me about now. You're in Vancouver. Yeah. You're 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 in this uh, Vancouver self-proclaimed hub of 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 Hollywood activity and film, mm -hmm. but you're having trouble getting a gig. Talk about what that's like. <sighs> you want to talk about PTSD? I know, <laughs> but that that's yeah. got to be hard because you're a talented guy. You're doing all the right things. Yeah. Right? yeah. You're, you're going to the right Thank school, you. and, and you're working hard, you're building the network, mm -hmm. you're going to work at the Umbrella. Arts Umbrella. Arts Umbrella. Yeah. You're, but it's, it's not happening. Why isn't it happening? <sighs> Lord almighty. So, speaking specifically for acting, one of the biggest things that's gonna happen is that when you're in Vancouver, your, the, the talent pool that you are now competing against is, exponentially higher you have like a hundred people that look very similar to you or a thousand people that look similar to you in comparison to maybe a few dozen or 50 or a hundred compared to the thousand right like there's there's so much more going on plus of course um, you know if, if you're not this is and this is one of the biggest challenges if you're not booking things they don't see, they look at your resume and they go, oh, you, you're not really, maybe you're not training right now. Maybe you're not booking anything. Okay, well, if, if I have a choice between you who did a great job and somebody else, but they've got a little bit more recognition or they've got some more stuff on their resume or they've worked with this person in the past, maybe they got better connection through a network. Like, Jeez. So, there's so many reasons why you can lose a job. So the proverbial gap in the resume really matters in the film industry? Uh, specifically, your training, yes. yes. And this is one of the things, like, even when I teach still to this date, even people who are in their 50s, 60s, who are just starting to get into the industry, um, one of the biggest things I always ask them right away is, let me see what your resume is. And many times I'll get people saying, oh, well, I have nothing on my resume. I'm like, that's not true. What we're doing right this second right now, you can add that to your resume. Of course. And that yeah. is going to be substantially more powerful than someone that has a resume full of extra work, which by the way, don't ever put that on your, your resume, um, or stand-in work or anything. They want to see, are you still training? Or are you stuck in this little niche of are you in a growth mode? Yes. Is what they want to see. A hundred percent. Yes. So it, it's ironic because if you look at my resume right now, even with all of the stuff that I have been booking and I have been absolutely blessed with what I have booked since I've moved home, my training resume is still longer than my booking resume. And my booking resume is growing constantly. Uh, so it's hard to find a gig in Vancouver. And yes. You, and you're doing it. You're getting the occasional commercial or something, right? I think in six years I was there, I booked one commercial with Shaw, which ended up getting pulled because, uh, to my knowledge, it was because of a copyright issue between the script of what we filmed was 
basically identical to a Super Bowl commercial that Spike Lee and Samuel L. Jackson did. So <laughs> they're like, well... You think those guys would have been a little more conciliatory? Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe. But uh, neither here nor there. That that was pretty much the only thing that I booked while I was out there. Uh, and then, of course, you know, there's it as an, especially as an actor, as a as a human being, when you part of our industry is rejection. And I'll tell you, <laughs> I, I have counted because I when I was a kid, I was like, I know exactly what I want to say when I win my Oscar one day, I have auditioned over 2,466 times. And I have booked over 20. Hmm. That's how often you will get rejected. Now, there are others uh, that will have a substantially smaller number than that and be like, yeah, I've booked way more than that. I've booked, uh, my booking ratio is a lot better. But that's not the part that matters. The part that matters is understanding that there are a billion and a half factors as to why you might not book a job. You might be too tall, you might be too short, your hair might be a different color. Even though you can dye it, they don't, it doesn't always go through their mind like that. They're like, well, if I can have a natural redhead, I'd rather go with a natural redhead instead of having to dye your hair, right? right, right. Uh, they could also be looking at what's, how are we doing for inclusivity? How are we doing, like maybe your nose is too big, too small, too nice, too off, too, like there's, maybe your eyes are the wrong color. There's so many ridiculous reasons. So it's, it's well, really about- Well, you must have left. Did you ever leave a few times thinking, I'm, I nailed this. I just nailed this and you thought, oh, I gotta be in the top, Mm-hmm. In the top two or three. Yep. Do they tell you that that you're in the top two or three, or that sometimes they call you back for uh, a, a second audition, that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. So, so you know you're close, right? Yeah. Sometimes you'll actually be lucky enough if, uh, and it usually happen when you have an agent. Um, but uh, sometimes you'll actually get told that you're pinned, and when you're pinned, it basically means that it's uh, it's down to you and like maybe one or two other people, and they're trying to decide. Is this the person that we're gonna go with? Let's not, please don't book something else right now just in case we do decide to go with you. And then you might not get it. I still, still remember this uh, because I'm a huge Star Wars fan. I got pinned for a Subway commercial for a Star Wars Subway commercial. And I think Chewbacca was the one that was like making the sandwich and I was like saying, like ordering a sandwich. It was the (laughs) coolest. The little thing, obviously, as a Star Wars fan, I'm like, this is going to be awesome. I used to hang out with Chili. Um, and I got pinned for it. And then when I, uh, then I found out, of course, because after a certain amount of time, when you don't hear anything back, you have to assume you didn't book it. Uh, and then sure enough, I saw the commercial, uh, and they ended up going with uh, a, a girl instead. And I was like, well. well that, that's a whole different look. Eh? Go, go, different look. And that's just it. Like, it. At that point in time, they're just like, no, we'd rather go it, this direction. It, but, you mentioned they're looking for certain things, but that mm-hmm. sounds like was there at times do they look at and just someone walks in and they go, Oh my gosh, that's what we gotta go with. No matter what we just said. This is the person. Have you have you heard of those stories? I have not heard of those stories. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, because because typically uh, uh, the the stories that I have heard before is where they actually they'll book someone and they'll be like, Yeah, I've got that person and they'll still hold auditions for the role. Which well, that, that hurts. It hurts, which of course, you at the time, you don't know that. And actually in most cases, you won't ever know that. And they won't be looking for a backup or an understudy or something, uh, a lesser role somewhere just to continue those mm, auditions? Maybe, and that, and that would realistically be a, a much better question for, uh, especially locally, either Jim Heber or Carmen Kotick, who are our main two casting directors out of Winnipeg, so. Very cool. Yeah. Hey, you said you, got a, you had an agent for a while. Yeah. What, what's that conversation like when you meet, you're looking for an agent and you're sitting down with mm. someone for the first time, what is that conversation like when you're saying, can you take me on? Oh, man. Uh, so I still remember when I first met that agent. Um, I was fresh out of school. I was stars in my eyes, ready to go. I was ready to take anybody as long as they would take me. I didn't care. Uh now that I'm older, uh, I am at that part where it's like, you really want to take your time. Do not take the first offer that gets thrown at you. And when you meet with them, you want to ask them questions. This person is supposed to be your business partner. 
It's not, oh, please, you're an agent, take me on, and then they're basically the mm -hmm. one in charge, mm -hmm. and you're mm -hmm. like, can you get me work? Like, think of them as your business partner. Who do you want to grow with? Who do you think is going to be able to help you market you? Right now, in my, at my point in the industry, I look at it as, who is going to sell me better than me? Because I don't know many people that will sell me better than me. And if I can find them, that is a perfect person to work with. I know actors who have had eight or nine different agents in their career so far. Just because you sign with someone doesn't mean you're stuck permanently with them. Try it out, get to, get to know them, get to have a feeling with them. Do you communicate well? Do you get along with that person? Do you think that they're all talk, no action or vice versa? Like how can you ultimately make that someone that is going to be your partner in crime, that is going to put your best foot forward for their interest as well as your own. Because again, and this is an important thing to stress, an agent does not get paid unless you get paid. Mm -hmm. If anybody ever offers or says, yeah, I'll do it for you, but you gotta pay me this much a month, that's a scam. Do okay, it. okay, hey, hey, that's really good to know for aspiring mm -hmm. actors up mm -hmm. there. So you're in Winnipeg, you're in Winnipeg, what brings you back there? Why wouldn't you just stay in Lotus Land? Uh, Everybody leaves Winnipeg. Many of our middle class people like you are young, aspiring, hardworking middle class people mm -hmm. like you leave and go pay your taxes somewhere else. It, it breaks our heart all the time. <laughs> so what made you come back? So uh, was it the Jets? Oh, boy, I'll tell you, that was, <laughs> it was tempting. Um, no, it's it's funny. So for about six years while I was there, every single year, my mom my dad, my sisters, everybody would try to convince me to come home. Um, but I just, I had such, and still do have such a love for this craft that I said, no, I, I know that this is where I have to be in order to succeed in this industry. Cause this is Hollywood North. This is where all, this is where all the CW shows, Supernatural, The 100, Riverdale, everything is all filmed here in Vancouver. Oh, you gotta be here. But every audition I went for, like almost every single audition I went for were one-liners, which there's nothing wrong with that. That's a great place to start your career. But I wasn't booking and it, it was driving me bananas. Uh, and I, I didn't care. I was gonna keep training with different coaches, with whoever I had to, shoot my own content if I had, whatever I have to do. But it wasn't until actually my wife reached out to me. Uh, my wife, obviously wasn't at the time. <laughs> uh, she, reached out to me and we hadn't talked in 16 years last time we had spoken was grade nine and we went our own directions and kids this is the a beautiful love story oh yeah i'm not going to tell this, the whole story this it's is terrible. a hallmark story it, so it truly is intently. <laughs> it truly is a hallmark story uh, but i'll try to just skip right to the end long story short um we hadn't talked in a very very long time and then suddenly she had reached out to me uh, we started connecting, uh, then we started building our relationship, but of course I was still in Vancouver, she was here in Winnipeg. Uh, and long story short, uh, I said to her, I'm like, at any point in time, if you want me to move home, you just have to say five words. I want you to move home, that's six, fail. Okay. <laughs> uh, and she did, and so I quit my job at Arts Umbrella the next day, I packed up a U-Haul and I drove across the country and came back to Winnipeg. And talk about that now you're in Winnipeg. And mm -hmm. You must have had great regret because you had this driving, burning need to, to make it there, right? So I, you I came did. back to Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. How's the experience been in Winnipeg for you? In my first, so I came, I took a huge risk coming back to Winnipeg. I was petrified, I'm not going to lie. I had no job lined up. I was going to be living at my parents' house while they were gone on vacation. Like I, I, I had nothing, but I was doing this for a combination of love and also to, to try and really kickstart. I, I wanted to bring all of the knowledge that I had learned from Los Angeles, from Vancouver, from major casting directors uh, like Deborah Aquila and Seth Yankowitz. I wanted to bring that back to Winnipeg and help other actors grow to that spot so that they don't have to go to Vancouver. And then ironically, uh, I started auditioning almost the moment I got back because uh, Jim Heber at the time had found out that I had moved home uh, and he said, great. And he had me go in for an audition uh, and it was in the first two months of being home. 
I booked a large principal on a Hallmark film. And then everything just started going and going and going. I started booking voiceover work. I, start, I did a, a Warhammer video game where I played six of the major villains in the whole game uh, alongside Andy Serkis, uh, which uh, if you don't know who Andy Serkis is, he does the voice of Smeagol. Oh. <laughs> he's, uh, he's the main guy from, from Lord of the Rings as Gollum. Uh, and he, yeah, he was, he was one of the main good guys in the video game. And I'm the main bad guy. Huh. So it was like, it's a surreal experience. I honestly, unfortunately, I didn't get to work with Andy, but my director, who I was working with at DeCapo, did, and we talk about it sometimes still because, as you can imagine, getting to work with uh, an infamous actor like uh, Andy Serkis is just the coolest experience. He's actually here in, uh, or sorry, he's in Calgary right now for uh, Calgary Expo. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Golem. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So it's it's just been it it's been one lucky break after the other, but. It's, it's a combination of luck and timing and skill and networking. Oh, my yes. goodness. Yes. Tell me about Winnipeg's rep now and how it's growing. Is there <clears> work <throat> for young actors? Is it, like you mentioned it to the co-host here that this is a place you can stay. It's an actual place. It's built itself up enough yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. It, Talk about that very quickly. Yeah. It's very speedily. It's, uh, it is, it's huge now. Winnipeg is blowing up for the film industry. We have two major studios being developed right now. We already have one that's been built, uh, Big Sky Studios over on Inkster. We have another massive one being done over in, in Headley. Headley. Yes. Yep, and then we have a pop-up one that's coming up in Niverville. Um, wow. So there's like major productions are going to be able to come to Winnipeg because we're gonna be able to offer the opportunity for them to do green screen stuff like you see in Marvel, mm -hmm. in uh, Disney, in Star Wars, in so on and so forth. So. It's really kicked Could open the door. Could we see the next Avatar here? I mean, I'm not going to lie. We have the space now that we could. Amazing, eh? Yeah. yeah. And, and that's, I think that's the biggest thing to note is that if you want that type of training, it is actually available here now. You can, you can go out and get that training here in Winnipeg. So you that, don't have to leave. That, Why spend the extra money? It's so much more expensive out there. It is. It is. <laughs> And did you feel, is, is there a difference between, I'll ask you something cultural, between sure. the Vancouver kind of atmosphere, mm -hmm. vibe, and the Winnipeg people atmosphere, vibe? I think our license plate still says it best. Friendly Manitoba. We genuinely, genuinely are the friendliest people I have seen to date. Van my, I still remember my very first day in Vancouver. I uh, was walking to VFS, and this guy, the second the light changed and said that he could walk, he started walking, didn't even care. And the car, there was a car that was already turning in the lane, almost hit him, and he smacks the car, and he's like, <laughs> almost like, like uh, uh, Dustin Hoffman, I'm walking here. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my gosh, like, they don't care. It's just like, it's business focused, you know, but that, and, and to be fair, that's not all Vancouverites, but, yes. um, but yeah, it's, it's just a very different atmosphere. You come to, to, to Winnipeg and we are, we're very much like the, the typical definition of a Canadian, right? It's very, the, the culture that we have in Manitoba, the friendliness of the Canadian aspect that you hear about. Oh, that's good. Oh, oh, that's, that's a class. class. Everybody run for your lives. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, uh, but yeah, it's it, it's it's amazing to be here. That's yeah. awesome. I, I want to give that plug to Winnipeg. Hey, we do something here called Quick Cues. I'm going to turn it over. I'm going to ask you a few questions. Turn it over <coughs> to Caden, who's going to put you through the gauntlet. Are you ready, Caden? Yeah, I'm ready. Right. So I'm going to ask you a few questions here. Yep. I've got about ten here, and they're rapid fire questions, and just say which other one you prefer. Done. Are you, uh, you ready? Hit me. All righty. First one: Star Wars or Marvel? Ooh, Star Wars. Okay, Starbucks or Tim's? Tim's. Dogs or cats? Dogs. Flash or Superman? <sighs> Superman. Night or day person? Mm, day person. Summer or winter? Oh, summer. <laughs> Restaurant or fast food? A restaurant. Books or movies? <sighs> movies. <laughs> iPhone or Android? Android. Football, or sorry, Jets or Canucks? <laughs> oh, Jets. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. 
And what is your favorite podcast? Oh Lord, um, the the arm. This one. This one. There Yay. you go. Adventures of Career Land. <laughs> Woo! Adventures of Career Land. Yeah, now we can actually run this <laughs> yeah. on, on the platforms because he answered the right question. You yeah. actually, for a minute there, he was pondering other yeah. podcasts. Yeah. I know. I looked at you and you looked scared. I looked at me. I looked a little worried. What is he saying? What's going on here? Shut this down right now. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, entering Romulan neutral zone. Ooh, ooh. Yeah. Anyway. Hey, you know what, Michael? Mm-hmm. That was so much fun having you on. And uh, thank you for having me. Oh, it's it's just great to hear your story. Your story is going to inspire people because students in so. in the division listen to the podcast. They listen to it in class sometime. Wicked. And uh, we've got we slow. You know, the eleven or twelve listeners we have mm. are really going to be impressed with awesome. your story of perseverance and resilience. And your coming back to Winnipeg is 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 heartwarming for me because we got one of ours back. Yeah. And yeah. that's important to me. Like our, some of our best people leave Yeah, uh, for the Albertas and the Vancouver's and, and the Toronto's, but it's really, really powerful when they come back and they start reminding everyone, hey, you don't know what you got here. So yeah. thanks for talking about our town. Of course. Um, and really thanks Love for your it. honesty. Like you could have said other things about, oh, everything's great. No, you. You laid it on the line. You said there was some trouble there. There were times I had to figure things out. I had to, but you're always in the growth mindset. I admire that a ton. And I'll, I'll let you know whenever they decide to f- to to film the movie of Adriano Magnifico, you can be Adriano. Okay, <laughs> I've decided you can be Adriano. I, I, I think you have what it takes. Anyway. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank Appreciate you so it. much for having me. And thanks pleasure. to the co-hosts here. Thanks yeah. for um, Thank you. thanks for being my sidekicks here. Thanks for the production team in there, Geneva Woo! and Phoenix. Appreciate it all. And that's it for another edition of Adventures in Career Life. <laughs>